Welcome everyone interested in this ancient text called the Bible, written thousands of years ago, and yet they say it's supposed to mean something to us today. And in order for us to understand what it means to us today, we're going to take some time to understand what it meant back then. I am your host, Jonathan the Dumb Christian. I once moved to Australia for a girl, but the Lord had different, better plans for me. Wink, wink, special shout out to the lovely Miss Emily Burian. Love you, babe. And we are going to explore the last chunk of John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. Make sure you go read it for yourself, but it's about to get real. We might get a little colorful. Buckle up and welcome to Dumb Christian. The last time we saw Jesus here where he grew up, Cana of Galilee, he had turned water into wine at a wedding feast. We read that Jesus then heads south uh, to head towards Jerusalem. And when he leaves, the people who knew that he turned water into wine could not keep their mouths shut and rumors spread like a wildfire that Jesus turned 180 gallons of tap water into the best wine that anyone had ever tasted. And, and they're starting to ask questions. The rumors are spreading and they say, wait, wait. The Jesus we know, the Jesus we went to high school with, the Jesus voted most likely to be a prude his whole life became the life of a party. He made good wine. I remember that party. I was there. That was Jesus, our Jesus, the Jesus that we used to give wedgies and swirlies to. Man, what a nerd that guy was. Surely it's not the same Jesus. But after Jesus leaves his hometown, his home area where he grew up, heads to Jerusalem, and then last time we're in John chapter 4, he's on his way back to his hometown, and as he makes his way through Jerusalem up through Samaria, heading back to Cana, John doesn't really tell us much that goes on, except for he meets a woman in Samaria at the well. Remember, we talked about that last time. But if we can match up... The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're going to discover that the other accounts, the other records of Jesus actually fill in some details that are going to offer us parts of the story that might make the way John ends this section a little bit confusing. So let's take a real quick recap of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell a very similar story. They tell similar events. They talk about the similar miracles, the similar teachings, the similar places that Jesus went. Matthew was written by the apostle Matthew, one of the 12 that God, that Jesus picked to begin with, right? Mark was writing down the story that Peter told about Jesus. Peter, also an apostle, but can't write. So Mark is learning from Peter, the apostle, and Mark writes his story, Peter, basically Peter's gospel. Well, these two gospels are floating around. People are learning about this Jesus fellow. And then a very wealthy man named Theophilus hires an investigative journalist with a master's in journalism. Well, he's a doctor of some sort. We don't know. He hires a guy named Luke to investigate, do some investigative journalism to find out if the stories that Matthew and Mark are telling are actually true. So Luke goes on this really long, like years long investigation to find out if those things were true. So he's investigating, doing interviews, and his gospel account comes up with very similar stories and events that Matthew and Mark included. But John's gospel is very different. Because John wasn't just somebody along for the ride. If we look at the way Peter and Jesus' relationship evolved and grew, Jesus was probably Peter's best friend. But John was probably Jesus' best friend. We can see that John's relationship to Jesus was different than Peter's relationship to Jesus. And there's some sort of like connection, real deep brotherly love, intimate connection between Jesus and John. And when you're hanging out with your friends, 
and somebody makes an offhanded comment or you hear a song or the waiter says this one line, you and your best friend will look at each other and you'll just laugh and everyone else will be like, what? What's so funny? And you guys say nothing. It's an inside joke because between you and your best friend, you see the things that you experience together in a different light. You consider with more significance other things that you and your best friend did together that others may have just seen as a casual experience. The the crowds looking around will write stories about the big events that stood out to them, but you and your best friend are going to talk about things very differently. And here John is telling the story not just of his best friend, but whose best friend he was. And he's recounting the story of this person that he loves dearly. And so he remembers aspect of their journey and their relationship together, maybe a little bit differently. Maybe more different things stand out to him than stood out to Matthew or Peter or those who Luke were, was interviewing. And so G- John's account here tells us that he makes his way up to Cana. The other gospels tell us that he did a number of miracles during that time. John doesn't record them. He uh, he healed a paralyzed man who had who couldn't walk at all. He healed him so that he could walk again and have a job and live his life. There was a, a man with leprosy and he cleans he cleansed his skin disease so that he had brand new baby fresh skin. There was a man whose hand was withered and wrinkled from arthritis and it was decaying and Jesus restored it to a fresh brand new hand. He calmed a raging storm while they were crossing the sea on a boat. And he did all these things in the other gospels, but John so far has only recorded one miracle, the miracle of water into wine, which also is not found in any of the other gospels. That's the first one he records. He goes to Jerusalem, comes up, has a conversation, does some things, blah, blah, blah. And then this is the second gospel that uh, the second miracle that John tells us about. And we're going to have to explore why here in a little bit. So Jesus is returning to Cana of Galilee. He's on his way back. And not only were the rumors of Jesus turning water into wine spreading rapidly like wildfire through Galilee and people trying to determine, is this our Jesus or is this someone who you guys have just confused to be our Jesus? Because surely our Jesus couldn't do these things. But then they start hearing more of these rumors about the miracles that Jesus is doing. They start reaching his homeland. They didn't have the internet and social media, but news traveled just about as fast when you're bored, right? I got to tell somebody. Uh, And so news gets back to Canaan. Hey, there's this guy named Jesus going around doing these miracles, healing paralyzed, uh, a paralyzed man, a withered hand, leprosy, calming the storm. And the people are asking, is this the same Jesus? Is this our Jesus? No way. We know a celebrity. And all of a sudden, like the, the, the tension grows and like the rumors are spreading and people are like, Oh, is this, could this really be? If it is, I went to class with him. I was in gym class with him. One time I bumped into him and got his sweat on me. I punched him in the face, but, but you know, I know that Jesus guy. And all these people are like really interested in Jesus return. All of a sudden, this guy who nobody cared to pay attention to, they want to know, are we friends with a celebrity friends? If you're listening, I'm putting quotations around friends. Do we know a celebrity? I grew up with that guy. And so word is spreading and people are starting to get excited about Jesus's return to Cana. Post update. I just saw Jesus take exit 84 to the Briley rest area where I think he's taking a break. Wink, wink, if you know what I mean. Hashtag Jesus is coming home. Post update. I just drove by Tim Hortons and saw Jesus ordering some Timbits. As he's just outside of town, hashtag Jesus runs on Tim Hortons. And the crowds begin to amass where Jesus is probably going to show up into town because they really want to see if this is their 
Jesus. They got their cell phones ready, ready for that selfie, that sneaky selfie to get him in the background. They've got their 8x10s for him to sign, and they're just eager, like, fangirling over Jesus' arrival. We know a celebrity! And he comes to town, and, and people are just clamoring over him. Oh my gosh, Jesus, is it true? Did you really turn water into wine? Will you turn this water into wine? I heard that you healed a guy's hand. Will you touch my hand? Jesus, did you really uh, calm the storm? Tell the weather to do something crazy right now. Jesus, Jesus, over here, Jesus. And everyone there is somebody that knew Jesus growing up. They, they were raised with Jesus. They heard about him his, their whole life. And all that they're interested in is, is this little like encounter for them to have so they can tell everybody about, man, J Jesus sweat landed on me. I, I managed to shake his hand. He kissed me, whatever. Except for one guy. There's a one guy in the crowd who didn't grow up knowing Jesus. This guy is, John says, an official. What, it, what the title means is he probably worked for a local politician. We'll say a state governor, a state senator, let's say. This guy works for a local politician. He didn't grow up with Jesus, but just like everyone else, he's heard the rumors. This guy is the, has the very finger of God in his life. He speaks with power and authority. And if he can do half the things that I've heard he can do, I need to go talk to him because this guy had a son who was dying. It says this official's son was near to death. So he comes to Jesus as he arrives to town and the, the people are just clamoring for a selfie, for a snapshot, for a little bit of Jesus' attention. And this guy is desperate amongst all the shouting and requests for a sign and a wonder and a miracle. So too is this man saying, Jesus, please heal my son. He's at the point of death and only you can save him. Jesus turns around and in the middle of, of these requests for Jesus to show them something cool, he says, you won't believe unless you see a sign or a wonder. You guys just want some parlor tricks. You guys don't actually believe in me. The only way you would believe is if I did something phenomenal, something incredible, something miraculous. And even then, your faith is, is not in me. You just want to get something out of me. And, and the, the man is, is determined. I'm not going to let Jesus sway me. So he stops Jesus, looks him in the eye, grabs him, says, please heal my son. Come and heal my son. He's going to die if you don't come and lay your hands on my son. This man is approaching Jesus because of what he's heard about Jesus. He doesn't know who Jesus is except to himself, he thinks, with what my life needs, what I need in my life right now, Jesus is worth exploring. Jesus is worth having a conversation with. It's worth it to go look into this Jesus person. He goes and he says, I know that you've done these things, so please come and do these things in my life. I know you've done them for other people. Please do them for me in my life. And what he originally says is, Jesus, come to my son. But Jesus responds with, your son is well. He will live. And then something happens inside this man where he, he no longer just thinks that Jesus is worth looking into or having a conversation with. But there's something about the way Jesus looked at him. There's something about the way Jesus' heart and, and, and interaction with the man shifted. Because this gospel doesn't tell us why Jesus changed his mind from well, you guys just want uh, some party tricks to actually honoring this man's request. Something shifted. And we hear other places, we read in other places that it says he changed his mind because he had compassion on them. And so there was something about this moment where this man experienced a shift from Jesus in his own life, in his own attitude. 
And he, he, when he thought he needed Jesus to come with him, when Jesus said, it's okay, your son will live, that thing you need in your life, I give it to you. He discovered the value of allowing Jesus to set the terms, not expecting Jesus to accommodate his own terms, but first he lets Jesus set the terms. And then he experiences something inside of him that shifts his belief that originated with the stories of someone else. Hey, did you hear about this Jesus guy? You should go check him out. To, I've had a conversation with Jesus. And because of the way he talks to me, I believe what he says, what he says is true. Not just what somebody else says, but what he says is true. And then it says the man went off and about the next day he finally makes it home because <clears throat> traveling is, is a little bit of a bitch in that day. He makes it home the next day. His servants rush out to greet him. Your son is alive and he's doing fantastic. He's getting better by leaps and bounds. It says the man believed Jesus when he said that his son was going to live. But I think we all know that there's a very huge difference between I believe this is going to work out and I've just experienced it working out, right? All of a sudden, he experiences this joy, this reality that I, it wasn't that I just believed, but it really did come true. And I'm experiencing the joy and the wonder and the awe. Wow, it really was true when Jesus said that my son would be okay. And then he thinks, he's wait, wait, wait. What time did my son start to get better? And the servant does some math calculations. It was right after lunch, about 1 p.m. And the man says, what? No way. That's when Jesus told me he would get better. And, and, and so he begins to connect all these dots and discover that not only did his son get better, but his son began to get better immediately when Jesus spoke the words, your son is going to be okay. That thing in his life, when Jesus spoke into that hurt place, that place of suffering, that place of despair and hopelessness, it was in that very moment that the words of Jesus began to take root and life is born in his son again. And this had such a profound impact on the man that not just, it's, it, it, remember, it started with he heard stories about Jesus. Someone told him about Jesus. Then he went, sought out Jesus himself, had a conversation, heard the very words of Jesus spoken into his life. And then when we, then when he went home, he had an encounter, a very real manifestation of those, of those powerful words of this Jesus. And it says that he and everyone in his house believed in Jesus because of this. And, and that's it. That's the story. It's like six, 12 verses or 13 verses or something. And then we never hear about this guy again. We've never heard about him before. And John ends the chapter, which he didn't write in chapters, but he ends the story with this little phrase that says, this was the second sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. It's the second miracle that John records. And John is making a specific note to identify. This is the second miracle Jesus did here where he grew up. In the other Gospels, we don't hear about any of the specific things that Jesus did in his hometown. In fact, we do hear the, a couple of the other Gospels tell us he didn't do miracles or at least not very many miracles in his hometown because people weren't believe they weren't interested in believing in him. They were interested in getting a good New York story out of him, an anecdote that they could share, a time hop, something that would pop up every year to remind them of this really cool encounter they had one time at church camp or at a youth event or some sort of rally where they had an encounter with cool guy Jesus. And that was a good memory. But John mentions in detail these two miracles that Jesus did do in his hometown the, where he grew up. The first miracle was at his mother's request. And then the second miracle was by a politician's aid. He's not even from round here. And Jesus is showing him grace and mercy and power. Because he's not interested in a little tchotchke or a knickknack or some sort of coffee table book to show off to guests. He's interested in who Jesus really is and what Jesus really wants to do 
in his life because growing up with Jesus, growing up learning about Jesus, hearing about Jesus, knowing Jesus isn't the same as believing in Jesus. And I think there's a very potent picture here for us to, to understand that um, Jesus is a lot more than a Beanie Baby collection that we can show off to people, something we can remind people, a story we can tell that we had experienced one time. But he is, in fact, the life giver, bringing dead things back to life, restoring hope, rev reviving withered hands, giving life to the paralyzed, cleaning leprous skin, and turning water into wine, and healing an official's, a politician's dying son. That is the end of John chapter 4. And we're going to continue on exploring in John chapter 5 next week. I love you guys. Catch you later. Guys, thank you so much for uh, walking through uh, the, uh, the last few verses of John chapter 4 as we learn about Jesus healing the son of a politician's aid. Yeah. Uh, be sure to share this with your friends, family. Give us a like, a subscribe. Don't go on this journey alone. Hit the bell. Here comes the butler. He helps. How can I help you? And we'll catch you guys in the next one. Love you guys. Bye.